Hello, everyone. Um, so thank you all for coming, uh, and uh, welcome to Cryptographic Wrong Answers. Um, so brief introduction. Hi, I'm LVH. Uh, I am a, originally a cryptographer, uh, and now I do a bunch of other stuff at a startup that I co-founded called Latacora. Um, Latacora is um, a consultancy, and we kickstart security teams for startups. So the idea is if you are thinking about your first security hire, uh, instead of trying to find that person and trying to figure out you know, how to vet them, um, you hire us. We come with a bunch of people with a bunch of different expertise. Um, and for example, cryptography, m most of what I do in my day job is, uh, is manage our, our cloud practice. Um, now, uh, disclaimer, uh, this talk does represent the opinions of my employer because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tiny company. It's, it's easy to say that when you're a co-founder. Um, but I don't speak for Okta, any of their partners. Generally, I don't speak for anyone other than myself and Ladakora. So, um, I'm going to talk about the past 25 years and some of the things that we can learn from that. In the last 25 years, crypto, um, and also any time I say crypto, that always means cryptography, and it never means cryptocurrency unless I explicitly say so. Um, so crypto has become necessary, uh, because like in 1995, SSL2 just got released, right? And this is like Phlogiston era, era crypto. Um, Phlogiston is like a, um, a theory of physics that has been completely debunked for a very long time. But the, you know, the bottom line is we didn't really know how, thing, how things worked. We had a couple of theories, and they completely fell over. Um, you know, things were not good. And in 2005, like maybe a couple of companies vaguely understood how to store passwords, right? But still, like we're not talking significant, um, we're not talking uh, like a significant maturity level. Now in 2015, you have SSO everywhere. Uh, every single application has like 30 external services or 20 external services um, that all have API credentials that you need to store somehow. Uh, decent HTTPS, decent password storage, decent data encryption are now table stakes. Like they're, it's not even optional anymore. Your session cookie is suddenly an encrypted blob for some reason. Uh, and we have magic internet money that uses chain blocks and uh, zero knowledge proofs. So crypto has become much more a part of our daily lives. Uh, and crypto has generally become, I think, less scary, at least for cryptographic engineers. I don't know if that's true for, for, um, for a wider developer audience. Um, but, you know, again, in 1995, you know, Flagest Crypto, nobody really knew what they were doing, right? And the official story, if you tried to learn more things, very often you'd hear um, what I call uh, abstinence-only education, where people just tell you, like, oh, you want to do some cryptography. Okay, don't. Um, in 2005... <laughs> Hypothetically, you could get it right, right? Like the, the uh, information was getting better. It was still kind of hard to access, but it, it was, you know, there, you, you had a snowball's chance in hell of making it. Um, there is still abstinence only education, right? 2005, you want to go and try and learn something, odds are you're still going to get a door slammed in your face. Now, in 2015, I think that the, that situation has markedly improved. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons why it's improved. Some of it is about accessibility, some of it's about education, and some of it is about conservatism. Um, so for accessibility, like in 2005, what would you have, right? Realistically, if you wanted to encrypt something in a database, you were going to call an open SSL API. And that was not going to end well. And it's not your fault. It's because, like, a lot of these APIs are, are just a complete beast to use. Um, documentation is missing, incorrect, uh, you know, all of the above. Uh, in 2015, you know, we, we really worked very hard on um, producing better libraries with primitives that do what it says on the tin, and they come with instructions on how to use them, and there's ideally no wrong way to use them, and, you know, there, there's a much, much better chance that you're going to get, um, you know, a libsodium call right than that you're going to get an OpenSSL call of any kind right. Uh, from an education perspective, we've done a lot of work as well. Um, there's uh, uh, CryptoPels, which is uh, a sort of, it's, uh, it's named because it's supposed to be like a pen pals thing. The idea is there's a bunch of exercises. People teach you how to um, break um, cryptographic uh, designs that have some kind of flaw in them. Uh, and once you complete a set, you go to the next one, you go to the next one, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea is that, um, you know, to, to make a lot of these attacks more approachable, um, I, I get the impression that still to this day, but certainly uh, in the past, a lot of um, cryptographic attacks um, have been you know, maybe not taken as seriously as they should have been, and I think that's because a lot of developers feel like, well, nobody's actually going to mount a cryptographic attack, right? That's for, like, ninja alien space hackers. Um, but the, the idea behind CryptoVals is, well, no, you, you plus five minutes from now, plus a Py Perl script, or a Python script, I guess, these days, um, are going to be able to break, you're going to be able to break this thing, right? This is, not, um, this is not abstract. We can make this very concrete for you right now. 
Um, I wrote a book called Crypto 101. Uh, I gave it away for free. Um, similarly, same, same approach. The only difference is instead of you know, just focusing on exercises, it focuses on sort of walking you through it. Um, some of the partners, uh, well, one partner of Ledecora, um, Thomas Ptacek, uh, has the questionable honor of being the person with the most karma on Hacker News. Um, and, uh, you know, the dude posts a lot, right? And uh, one of the things that he posts a lot about is, uh, is cryptography. Um, and one thing that we, that we wrote recently, Tom and I, um, is a blog post called Cryptographic Right Answers. It was a, an update from a, a series of previous blog posts. And the idea was, okay, let's give you, you know, instead of, um, you're, you, you're going to Google something, you're going to get a bunch of answers. How about we just tell you what we think you should be doing for this one specific thing? So it's very straight and narrow, right? We're not saying this is the only thing you could do that might be correct. We're saying, here's what we think you ought to be looking at first, right? Um, and obviously, the, the name of this, uh, of this talk is a direct reference to, um, to that blog post. Um, and also, generally, just conservatism. Uh, I think you can, you can safely summarize this talk as use less exciting things. Um, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of stuff that will, uh, that will end up biting you. So really what I'm saying is all is well, right? Uh, or, well, maybe it's not. I don't think we're out of the woods yet. Uh, a lot of the problems uh, that we're still faced with is, you know, people will make bad choices today, right? Like the market penetration of uh, our attempts at education isn't 100%. Um, a lot of those choices are very hard to walk back. Um, you know, either you're trying to encrypt some stuff in a database, and uh, if you wanted to update it, you have to now re-encrypt the entire database. That might be really annoying. Um, they might be um, wire protocols and like embedded hardware. So if we told you to go upgrade it, then you now need to go like you know RMA 10,000 devices. Um, even just waiting for people to patch stuff, like even if you're in the easy case, uh, it turns out that it, uh, you know people will. Uh, people will take a very long time to do stuff. I mean, there are entire companies, like, for example, Red Hat, as far as I can tell, their main, you know, their main source of res revenue is like software necromancy. Um, so even though all of these, um, you know, even though it's, it, we've done a lot of work, we've gotten a lot better, um, there's still gonna be bad ideas tomorrow, and they're still gonna impact people tomorrow. So the idea is, okay, let's look back at some of the things that haven't panned out, um, over the course of you know, the last 5, 10, 20 years. Um, and let's see what we can learn from that. And let's say if, you know, if a new spec comes, to, comes um, if we come across a new spec tomorrow, um, can, we, you know, can we decide ahead of time whether or not that's likely to be a good idea, you know, if we would still agree with that five years from now. Now, the talk is necessarily kind of phrased as a negative, right? It's cryptographic wrong answers. I'm going to say a lot of things about um, protocols that are not very nice. Uh, and maybe that's okay, because we've said a lot of positive things in the past, and uh, when we asked for feedback, a lot of people seem to say, that, like, no, we also want you to tell, you know, we also want you to tell us how it goes, how it goes wrong. Uh, but I want to be clear, like, I'm not impugning anyone's character. Uh, in fact, you'll notice that I named very, very few names in, uh, in this presentation. Um, you know, this is just about, first of all, it's just about the technologies, and second of all, I'm not saying that the technologies are broken, I'm saying that they could have been done better. So, the uh, alternative title to this uh, title slide for this talk is Cryptographic Wrong Answers, A Rant in B-flat Minor. Uh, B-flat Minor is the, uh, the funeral march, uh, if you're wondering. Uh, just to set the uh, literal and proverbial tone for the rest of the talk. Um, now, of course, this is not the right room because you're all here. You're all people of ex exquisite taste and distinction. You already know all of the things that I am about to say. Um, now, even then, I'm hope, I hope to make this talk useful, um, because you're going to be in a conversation tomorrow with someone on the internet or perhaps a coworker, and that person is going to say something that might not be great. Uh, and it would be helpful if you had a bunch of rhetorical tools in your, uh, in your proverbial toolbox to uh, help that conversation go right. Um, a lot of good talks, in my opinion, are born out of a uh, specific frustration. And for me, that specific frustration for this talk, I'm not saying this talk is good, but you know, uh, give me the audacity of hope. Um, the frustration is that a lot of really bad, no good, and downright silly ideas can be made to sound like good ideas to smart and well-meaning developers. Uh, and when I say be made to, you know, that sounds like there's sort of active deception going on. That is not what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying, you know, the, it's just that it's very easy to make a bad idea sound good. Um, and we'll show some examples of that. So, for example, OAuth 2. Uh, when you look at the predecessor for OAuth 2, OAuth 1A, um, it did HMAC SHA-1, which is a weird crypto thing, right? Um, and the explicit goal in the spec was sort of maybe kind of work without TLS. 
And in an OS2 early draft, immediately called out, you know, weird crypto is bad, you should just use TLS. Uh, you know, what are we doing with this whole HMAC SHA-1 thing? All of this sound like good ideas, I think, to well-meaning, well-intentioned developers. So some of the fallacies here, first of all, HMAC SHA-1 isn't that weird. I have a hard time thinking of a more conservative um, cryptographic primitive than HMAC SHA-1. There are a few things that I have more faith in. Um, second of all, TLS gets you transport security, but then if you look at the actual vulnerabilities that OAuth 2 is faced with, very, very, very few of those are transport security vulnerabilities. Um, there's also sort of like redirect bugs, CSERF bugs, domain confusion. We'll go through some of those in, in more detail. But the bottom line is that uh, uh, OAuth is perfectly capable of losing your credentials uh, over TLS. Another example is JWT. Now, people say we want encryption, uh, encrypted tokens, crypto is complex, and interop is good. Some of the fallacies there are, first of all, I doubt that you actually legitimately want uh, a uh, signed token, except in very, very few cases. Uh, if you're absolutely certain that it's uh, better than 16 random bytes, it should be easy to answer why is that actually better than something I go store in the database. Um, you have all sorts of problems like revocation. You have these sort of like repeated bananas vulnerabilities that lead to authentication bypass. Um, now you can say, look, those are all implementation vulnerabilities. It's not actually JWT's fault. Uh, I disagree, right? Like, if I can find the same vulnerability in five popular libraries, then maybe the spec did a bad job of making sure that people avoided that vulnerability. Um, so, in conclusion, A, I, I'm not entirely sure that you wanted signed tokens to begin with, and B, if you do, I, I don't think you wanted JWT. And then finally, DNSSEC. Uh, again, very well-intentioned idea. Everything starts with the DNS lookup. DNS is plain text, and it's very easy to spoof, right? If I'm in the same Starbucks as you, then I can basically make DNS say whatever I want it to say. So let's sign DNS records. There's a whole pile of fallacies in there, um, but like, there's all sorts of problems. Like, for example, DNSSEC doesn't protect um, the last mile of DNS. It doesn't do anything when your laptop is trying to ask the local DNS server for what something is. Um, spoof DNS doesn't actually matter for compromising TLS security. Like, literally anyone who has logged into a captive portal, um, you know, presumably either on the flight here or at the hotel you ran into this, like, your browser will tell you, like, hey, by the way, Google.com doesn't actually look like Google.com because there's a, new, uh, because there's a, there's a naughty um, DNS server in, in the way. Um, there's all sorts of other problems, but uh, if I keep talking about DNS, like, I'm going to be uh, talking the entire, uh, the entire rest of the, the slot. So, um, there's a bunch of problems here. So, again, the pattern is there's a problem, there is a proposed solution, it sounds like a good idea, and it turns out to be really bad. And I find that very frustrating. Uh, I want the good answer to be obvious. Now, let's be clear, uh, I realize that I'm at Octane, I realize that Octa is a company that ships uh, OAuth 2 and JWT. Just to repeat again, anything that I say, I don't speak for Octa, yada, yada, yada. I am not saying that if you use Octa and JWT, then therefore, therefore you have a vulnerability, definitely, for sure. Uh, I'm saying that there are poor specs. I'm saying that there are problems that were caused because of a deficiency in the design that could have been avoided. Um, so the question is, can we learn from that and how? DNSSEC is definitely always bad, though, so it doesn't count for DNSSEC. Um, so in conclusion, the idea is, you know, we're going we're gonna to look for pitfalls that we can recognize. And to do that, I'm going to, like, just run through a bunch of bad ideas that, um, that keep coming back and that every time lead to disaster for some reason. Um, and so one of the very popular ones is algorithmic agility. Same spiel, um, you know, the idea is, look, we have primitive A, um, and primitive A might be, I don't know, AES or something, um, but what happens if it breaks, right? We like that, we want to use that primarily, but we want to have an option, just think, we want to have something to fall back on. And the idea is we support both, uh, and when A breaks, we just go turn on B, and, uh, and everything's copacetic. A uh, very related problem is negotiation. So let's say that I support A, B, and C. You support C, D, uh, sorry, B, C, and D. Uh, and somehow we're going to figure out that, um, you know, B and C is what we can both agree on, but we like C better, so somehow, hopefully, we're going to end up with C. Again, this is a really, really plausible-sounding, um, you know, engineering decision, and it turns out to very re regularly turn into, uh, turn, get us into trouble. The poster child for this is TLS. Um, so TLS has a cornucopia of things that you need in order to make it work, right? There's signing, there's key agreement, there's bulk encryption, there's Mac algorithms in there. I'm not even going to mention, like, you know, variety of curve choices and key, cha and key sizes. But for each of these choices, TLS gives you, you know, gives you a handful of, of options. And it's not like a perfect Cartesian, uh, it's not like a perfect Cartesian product, but it, it, it's pretty darn close. Now, the question is, why does it hurt to support more things, right? Just go turn them off. 
Well, it doesn't really work that way, uh, because very often you'll see protocols come back from the dead, right? So Freak and Logjam um, were um, real-world TLS vulnerabilities that exploited export-grade ciphers, which you know, pretty much died out at the late, in the late 90s. Uh, Drown, in 2016, very recent TLS vulnerability, exploited vulnerabilities in SS, in, on real servers on the internet, and a very significant portion of them uh, exploited vulnerabilities in SSL v2, which is uh, almost 20 years, 20 years older. People generally don't minimize cipher suites, right? If you look at uh, SSL labs, you look at like the A-plus servers, and you go click through on them, and you'll see that, sure, they support good things, but they also support a bunch of bad things. Um, so it is true that TLS in the past has been saved by algorithmic agility, and I contend that this is still a bad idea. So uh, those of you who remember Beast, it was an attack from uh, a couple of years ago, and um, we, as a, a sort of uh, uh, an emergency answer to Beast, um, we started turning on RC4 everywhere. Um, but the problem is, at the time, we already knew RC4 was broken, right? It was not as badly broken as um, you know, uh, beast, as, as beast affected cipher suites were, were um, but it was still pretty, pretty broken. Um, the reason I think that it's still not an argument for, um, for algorithmic agility is that the real reason is that updates lagged, right? People were way behind. Beast is from 2011, Poodle was in 2014, a similar, similar sort of vulnerability. Um, but the attack, the core attack that, that it exploits is from 2002, right? It was fixed in TLS 1.1, which was 2006. Again, predates all of these uh, attacks by many years. And the real reason is that, you know, browsers took like six years to, to implement it. And they, in the end, they only implemented it because there was a vulnerability and there was a clear and direct need for it. Um, and browsers, I don't want to put all the blame on browsers. Browsers were following the server's lead. The servers were even worse. So uh, really, I don't think you know, the answer here is we need algorithmic agility. The answer is you need to patch your software. Um, as a counterexample of, of algorithmic agility, and this is an example I'm going to use a, a bunch in this talk, uh, WireGuard. WireGuard is a modern VPN. Uh, it is currently available on, uh, on every platform. Uh, it brings me great joy to say that. For a long time, it was Linux only. Um, there is one version of WireGuard, right? There are no ways to misconfigure WireGuard. It is either right or it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't negotiate, it always gets you strong primitives, uh, and we expect it to hold up for the foreseeable future. And if something happens to it, we will get a WireGuard 2. We will not add, uh, well, I mean, I can't speak for the author of WireGuard, but uh, with almost epistemological certainty, I can tell you, nobody will add um, you know, uh, version negotiation to WireGuard. Like, no, there will just be a new version of the protocol, and you either update or you don't. Um, JDBT, for some reason, is not really the poster child for uh, algorithmic agility. I don't know why that is, because it also supports a cornucopia of algorithms, and it does get it in trouble, and we'll talk about that more in the rest of the talk. Um, but to just give you an idea, for example, um, with JDBT, you can do um, RSA encryption. Um, you can do that with PKCS v15 and uh, RSA OAP. The good news is that at least one of these is safe. The bad news is that it's not the one that anyone actually implements. Um, also, JDBT supports Algnon, so, you know, uh, I'm not sure if that's an algorithmic agility bug or... Uh, mm, nah, mm. Uh, so, but the takeaway is that algorithmic agility was a very defensible idea in the 90s. All of our primitive protocols were legitimately worse then. We had a good reason to have less faith in them. But at the end of the day, it turns out that it caused significantly more problems than it solved. And, you know, many, even very recently, again, Drown 2016, uh, we're seeing attacks from 20 years ago come back just because of things that fundamentally are uh, the consequence of, of algorithmic agility decisions. So instead, version of your protocols update aggressively. Another really bad idea are committees. Problem with committees is that they have no focus. Uh, and obviously, I'm overgeneralizing. Um, but they produce kitchen sink specs, and they are very often so slow that they end up being unresponsive to the real problem, or they end up being so distracted in, dis in wanting to write a specification that they forget what the actual problem was that they, wanted to, that they set out to solve to begin with. Um, now, we're going to talk about kitchen specs plenty, of, uh, uh, plenty in the talk, um, but just to give you an idea about unresponsive. So I mentioned that OAuth has serious problems, and I think that committees are one of the reasons that OAuth has a problem. So 2010, OAuth 1.0, uh, just to give you an idea of like contemporaneous technologies, that was backbone, that was Angular, right? Like single page apps were sort of happening. 2012, OAuth 2, we got the iPhone 4S, uh, and uh, React was just around the corner. Uh, so clearly, native and, and single-page apps, like, they were already a thing when OAuth 2 came out. Like, it was not, um, you know, it was not just a fad. Like, it was pretty clear that that was going to be uh, a, significant, uh, a significant use case to support. So 
The OAuth 2.0 RFC supports a number of um, off, uh, su supports a number of flows, and these are just different ways that somehow a third party can get some credentials uh, on behalf of, of a user. Um, now, when you look at RFC um, uh, 6749, this is the original OAuth RFC, and you ask it, like, okay, well, what do you do about native apps? There's literally a section about native apps in there, and I uh, really recommend that you read it because it's, it's, it's very strange. Um, it suggests things like, well, I guess you could register a scheme with the operating system, or I guess you could run a local web server, and then you could talk to that web server, or maybe you want a web extension or something. Or I guess you could embed a browser. That one I particularly enjoy because if you recall, the entire point of OAuth was let's stop giving our credentials to random applications just because they want to access my pictures or whatever. And apparently the answer is, oh, actually you should type in your username and password into a uh, web view that is entirely controlled by that one application, which is exactly the same thing as giving, your, uh, giving them your username and password. Um, now, predictably, because there was, you know, there was essentially no recommendation, and therefore this resulted in disaster. Um, a very common problem with, uh, with OAuth has been, uh, with OAuth 2 has been that uh, if you have, let's say, a phone, you have two apps on the phone, and because the phone is incapable of making sure that the, um, the redirect in the OAuth flow, so the authentication code, goes to the right app, a malicious app will intercept the code, um, and, uh, and because the, um, the, you know, you can download the app, I can inspect the APK or I can, you know, inspect the thing that I download from App Store. So it's not like I can put a secret uh, or credential inside the, the good app to distinguish it from the bad app. Uh, and so as soon as you have the auth code, you know, it's game over. Um, now, OAuth eventually decided to fix this, and they fixed this with a thing called Pixie. Um, now, Pixie, actually, the diagram that I just showed you is lifted from the Pixie spec. Um, now, it reintroduces cryptographic binding. So if you remember, you know, the entire point of OAuth 2 was, oh, you know, forget about that whole HMAC shell one thing. We should just do TLS instead. Actually reintroduces cryptographic binding. Um, this was an open problem for three years, but don't worry. I'm told that absolutely nobody wrote any mobile apps in that period. Um, and also, by the time that Pixie got done, um, it, the, uh, the major mobile platforms already had a mechanism uh, or we're contemporaneously releasing a mechanism to securely link into an application. And the fundamental problem that Pixie solves is how do we fix the problem that uh, iOS or, or Android can't, you know, securely link me into the right application. So even when it's successful, it, it's almost so slow as to be, to be unsuccessful again. But the good news is that OAuth 2 is complete now, and we sort of know what to do except for, you know, that whole Pixie thing. Um, so it's 2019, and I have a single page app, and I want to know what to do. If you believe all zero or octadox, the answer is implicit flow. If you believe Aaron Parecki, uh, it, then the answer is, oh, who is an Octa employee, by the way, I believe, um, the, uh, the answer is an auth, an auth code flow with no secret and maybe Pixie. If you believe the security best practice RFC from December 2018, then the answer is, nope, everyone use Pixie at all times, forget the implicit flow. And if you believe the top voted Stack Overflow answer, then the answer is, no, don't use Pixie, that makes no sense for single page applications, didn't you read the spec? Um, so in conclusion, nobody knows. Um, but the good news is we do know how to do the OAuth flow, except for the whole Pixie stuff, except there's still redirect bugs. Uh, so when I, um, when I perform an OAuth flow, does anyone happen to know, um, you know, so I, I let's say I, uh, you know, I sign into Okta, I type in my username and password, uh, and I get redirected back to the application, right? That redirect has to happen some mechanical way. There's an HTTP thing that happens. Does anyone know what the correct answer is for uh, what the redirect code is? Because there's a lot of 30Xs in there. Uh, 302? Uh, 302 is extremely close, and you are usually okay as long as you're in browsers. Um, so the reason is, so the, the underlying problem here is, uh, so the, the really, really bad one, the one that's always bad, and 302 is some, sometimes bad in that sense, is uh, 307, temporary redirect, which some, um, some um, uh, web frameworks will uh, encourage you to use if you're, if you're uh, you know, saying that something is not a permanent redirect. The underlying problem here is that, like, in the HTTP sense, sometimes a redirect means, okay, go look at this other thing next, and sometimes a redirect means, oh, the thing that you're asking for has a different name now, and you should go ask this other URL. But the problem is, if you do, if you have that second one, that means that the browser is going to try and repeat that request. Um, when you repeat that request, you know, think about what the last thing is that you probably sent to whatever your IDP was before it decided to authorize you. It is almost certainly like a username, password, and TOTP code. Um, so now you've conveniently disclosed the username, password, and TOTP code to a uh, different third party. Now, there are other bugs, but my point is about specification uh, and a lack thereof, right? The point of this talk is not 30 minutes of dunking on OAuth. Um, but 
I think the, the sort of core point that I want to get to is you either have to be a spec or you have to be a meta spec. OAuth 1.0a was a concrete specification, and by comparison, OAuth 2.0 was a set of hopes and dreams. Right? And I mean that in a, in a nice, I mean, um, I don't mean that in a super nice way, but I mean that in a sort of nice way in the sense of, like, it's not bad to be a meta spec. It is bad to be a meta spec that pretends to be something that you can implement because you can't. Uh, and the RFC title kind of gives it away, right? Because if you look at the OAuth 1a spec, it calls itself a protocol. And if you look at the OAuth 2 spec, it's the authorization framework, uh, which is significantly more vague. All 2 is not a spec. It looks like one to most people, right? Earlier, when I compared OAuth 1a to, to 2.0 in the beginning of the talk, I don't think there was, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there was anyone in the audience that went like, no, 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 that's a category error. One of those things is an orange, and the other kind is a wrench, and you can't compare the two. Uh, no, like, the, the RFCs even say, like, no, one deprecates the other, one is deprecated by the other. Like, it's very clear that you're supposed to be able to replace them, but I don't think that's really true. Uh, I think OpenID Connect success is in part because it gets us a lot closer to being an actual specification. There are serious problems with OpenID Connect as well, most of them inherited from all two, but at least, you know, like you could plausibly implement it. Now, that said, th this, is, this is the one slide that I will admit is a little bit of a dig, but I think it's funny. It's, it's, in, it's, a, it's in good humor. Um, so it's not for lack of effort, because serious question, what do you think has more pages? The uh, Jose IETF w, uh, workgroup docs, so that is, uh, JWT, JWK, JWS, JWA, JWTF, like all of those specs. Um, though th that has a bunch of documentation. That has a bunch of pages. The OAuth IETF work, um, work group has a bunch of documentation. And James Joyce's Ulysses. Which one of these documents has more pages in it? Anyone want to guess? Uh, I mean, punchline is it's OAuth, right? Like, so OAuth has significantly more pages. Well, no, it's not significant. It's slightly more pages than James Joyce's Ulysses. Um, so you can be a meta spec and still be good. And my good exa my example of that is noise. So um, noise is a pattern language for building wire protocols. You pick a pattern, <clears throat> you get some properties. It explicitly does not fix the implementation. You can do what it, like it, it tells you what you can replace about it and still have a protocol at the end. Everything, but that said, it's still far fewer options than JWT. We'll see later that JWT, um, you know, gives you uh, honestly more more options than you than you should have within the same spec. Uh, everything sort of follows the same, uh, the same mechanism. An example of a spec, again, I'm going to use WireGuard. WireGuard is based on noise. So WireGuard is more of a byte-level defined implementation, very concretely, you either do WireGuard or you don't, version of noise. <clears throat> so takeaway, good specs tend to describe current design. They're not building a new one, at least not in the context of a committee. Someone designed this and they're telling you about it. There's a handful of ways that you can operate it, ideally only one. Uh, it has, it's highly specified, it has test vectors, like there, there's, you know, there's a hex string there, and if the thing that you get out of your implementation isn't that hex string, it is wrong. Um, there is clear usage guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. So I want narrower specs. Uh, another problem that keeps coming back is multi-step processing. So, uh, to give you a, so the idea is that you have to parse the message in order to figure out what to do next. Uh, and so a typical example of that is JWT alg header, pretty much any SAML structure, and TLS. Um, so there's a concept called the cryptographic doom principle, uh, first, uh, um, first coined by Moxie Marlin Spike, uh, who is a very accomplished cryptographic engineer. Um, if you have to perform any cryptographic operation before verifying a Mac on a message you've received, then it will somehow inevitably lead to doom. Uh, and so one example of that is PKCS 7 padding. Um, so if you have um, uh, AES CBC, which is a very common uh, way to encrypt a stream, uh, it can only encrypt multiples of 16 bytes. Um, and so when, obviously, not every message is a multiple of 16 bytes, so sometimes you have to pad it at the end. And the way you do that is you add <clears throat> missing bytes of the same value as uh, the number of bytes that are missing. So if you have three bytes missing, you have three 0x03 zero zero bytes. Uh, and when you're decrypting, you have to check the padding. Now, um, this is uh, messed up TLS. For example, the poodle attack, the beast attack are all examples of where TLS falls over because they don't validate a Mac first. Uh, and the reason for that is um, the way that TLS does it is you first Mac the plain text, and then you combine it, and then you encrypt it, which means that when you want to decrypt it, you first have to decrypt it. Now you have the padding plus, um, plus sorry, you have the plain text, the padding, and the Mac. And you have to check what the, whether or not the padding is valid before you move on to the Mac. And like all of these attacks, lucky 13, lucky microseconds, like there's just a giant pile of TLS attacks that are all a consequence of this very, very simple flowchart where, you know, there's just one box that's on the wrong side. There's only two boxes, and somehow they got already put in the wrong order. Um, 
And to be fair, like this was in 1995, we legitimately did not know what the right answer was. There were people who said, no, this is actually the superior design because X, Y, Z. Um, but the jury's now out on that. Um, in SAML, any part of the message can be signed or encrypted. Real IDPs only really use a fraction of the functionality, uh, and, but the problem is it's not always the same fraction. So implementers have to deal with the entire spec, and attackers get to play with the entire spec, which is not a good thing. Um, so SAML uses uh, XML signatures. There's basically two popular implementations. One of them is in Java standard library. The other one is libxmlsec1. Um, now, those libraries aren't them are themselves uh, sometimes somewhat troublesome, but neither of them is your XML parser, which means that whatever is validating your signature can disagree with your XML parser about what that XML means. For example, let's say that I had some SAML for user at user.com.evil.com, and I put a comment there in the middle. And I legitimately own the domain user.com.evil.com. Um, and I managed to get an IDP to sign it for me. Um, this was a real vulnerability uh, in that um, I think in the last two years or so got, um, got released. Um, the, the, the problem with this is there are multiple canonicalization strategies. Uh, DSIG will typically do one called uh, EXC C14N, because that's more or less the, the only one that counts. And uh, parsers will generally just like, yeah, sure, whatever. It's some XML. I parsed it. Um, so the problem is that SIG validation will disagree with your parser about what the actual XML tree looks like, and then you get up vulnerabilities like that. As a general rule, canonicalization, bad idea. Um, JDBT has a very similar problem. Uh, lots of supported styles of operation all gated on ALG. So we have asymmetric encryption. Um, you have ECDH with uh, an ephemeral and a static key. You have symmetric encryption. You have signing. You have macking. These are totally different things, right? They don't fit in the same universe. They have like completely different opinions on how how you need how you should be using them. Um, but JDBT all, all combines them in the same spec. Uh, as an example of where that breaks, uh, JDBT had uh, RS-256, which is uh, an RSA signature. Um, I send you an HS-256 token, uh, which is HMAC. Uh, your JDBT library uses your RSA key material uh, for some reason that I can't even begin to fathom. Uh, and specifically, it will use the public key. But of course, the public key is public, which means that I know the key that was used to authenticate the token, and you get the idea. Um, so, and then you get arbitrary JDBT forgery. Uh, again, you could argue this is an implementation bug, this is not a spec bug. I disagree. If I can find the same vulnerability in multiple implementations, then there is, I consider that significant evidence that the real problem is that the spec did not do a good enough job of preventing that vulnerability from existing. Um, again, JDBT alg none, obviously. It's nice that it's mandatory to implement. Uh, I say that as uh, you know, someone who is regularly in the position of an attacker, at least. Um, you know, literally any token would validate. That's not great. Um, you could argue what sort of bug that is. It depends on your perspective. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't really care for the, the ontology here. Um, but the takeaway is safe specs have one authenticator. It is always of the same type. And it is all the way on the outside of the thing. And you can't do anything until you validate that authenticator. Um, and uh, the takeaway, if you're Satan and your job is to design poor cryptographic, uh, uh, poor cryptographic specifications, is you want to make sure that it's very confusing why your spec is bad. You want to find like five or six different reasons, because then there's sort of like no angle to start, uh, to start at it. Uh, it makes it much harder to explain why it's bad. And before you know it, JWT. Um, so another problem, rich external error messages. Again, from a, you know engineering perspective, super obvious that this is a good idea, right? Error messages are good. Like, error messages should be descriptive. But in reality, this is really, really bad. A lot of the attacks that I just mentioned um, rely on something called an oracle. Um, basically, what that means is I will craft a message. A, I will manipulate a message in a very specific way um, so that it is almost certainly invalid. But the way that you respond to the invalid message tells me something that I want to know that I'm not supposed to know. It will tell me something you know, like, you know, how do I make an RSA private key operation? It will tell me, you know, how do I decrypt a, a message, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So very often, these will be like repeated, right? So I, I make one small modification. I try the next thing, try the next thing, try the next thing. And after you know, a couple of thousand messages, maybe, uh, I will learn how to de decrypt a block. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can have different behavior in the face of errors. One way is uh, have an explicit error code. So this was the problem that was in original SSL. Like it would literally give you a different error code depending on what the problem was. And then it's very easy to mount that attack. Um, modern versions uh, of TLS don't return the same error message, but some implementations will take a little bit longer or a little bit less time uh, to respond depending on what the problem is, and then you can leverage that. Uh, another problem is, uh, you know, the thing that you should check, uh, look out for is a lack of security proofs. I mentioned all the way in the beginning of the talk the Flagaston era of crypto. Uh, one of the things, one of the big things that got us out are security proofs. So there are general proofs of security for, like, 
um, for um, primitives, and, and there are also more, um, there's also techniques for approving things about protocols. Um, mostly, you know, you're, I'm not going to try and make you uh, an expert in security proofs. Uh, I don't think that's going to that's work in the time slot allotted to me, but um, I do want to make sure that you have, like, at least of an inkling of what to look for. Like, if you see a spec, um, when, you know, what is the thing that, that um, should give you a little bit more confidence? So if you see words like game, uh, adversary, advantage, that's a good sign. Um, if you specifically, if, if it tries to prove that there's a reduction to an already assumed hard problem, or there's a reduction to a different primitive, like, and that's a primitive like AES or something else that you have a lot of confidence in, um, then that's a good example of, you know, that's the sort of thing that you're looking for. Um, protocol proofs are, uh, are a, I'm not going to say newer, but um, they've gotten more popular recently. Um, you're looking for words like Kennedy Krochik. Uh, you're looking for words like Tamarin. Uh, I'll put these slides up. Please don't you know, try to remember all that. But um, the, essentially what they argue is that in a particular protocol, something can't happen, right? So for example, it will argue that um, the key will remain secret uh, if, in, you know, if these things hold. Uh, it will argue that you get forward secrecy. It will argue you know, that certain subtle bugs can't happen. Uh, and this, these work in real life. So TLS 1.3, very, very recent. There was a draft. It had a bug in it, and the automated protocol prover found it, and none of the people looking at it found it. So, uh, or at least not in time for the protocol prover found it faster. Um, and similarly, WireGuard, for example, has a Tamarin proof that proves that all sorts of things uh, can't happen. Uh, big problem here, I mentioned that I wasn't going to name names. A uh, big problem here that I've noticed is that the, uh, the quacks have gotten more, uh, more efficient. Uh, in particular, uh, just because it says QED doesn't mean that it's proof. That's one of the reasons that I, uh, I've found a couple of those recently. Um, so uh, another failed thing that should be a uh, relish to the trash heap of history is uh, key, par uh, key parsimony. So um, what I mean by that is trying to be stingy with key material or reusing the same key in different contexts. For example, with RSA, RSA you can encrypt, you can sign, uh, and so all RSA cipher suites use that property because you will always sign with RSA if you have an RSA certificate in TLS. You can optionally also choose to have the client encrypt some secret to you using that same key. Um, Drown exploited this. Like the reason uh, uh, Drown was possible was because RSA did this thing wrong. Or, or sorry, TLS did that thing wrong with, um, with RSA. Um, so just don't do that. Have multiple keys. Same thing with SAML. Um, you know, because SAML uses asymmetric cryptography, technically you can have one IDP, has one set of keys, and every service in the world that you talk to, uh, you all use the same IDP key pair. Um, best practice tells you not to do that. Um, there's a bunch of reasons why, but uh, one of them is that audience restrictions are really easy to ignore. Like, it's, it's unsafe by default. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the interesting caveat there, though, is that because you end up with one key pair per IDP and relying party, um, that means that you actually might as well have used symmetric crypto, and that the whole thing, like all of the problems that SAML has inherited, because it used more complicated crypto, um, end up being for naught, because in practice you don't actually get any benefit from that. Uh, another idea that we should stop having is uh, key encapsulation. Um, so the idea is that public key crypto is somehow easy to use. I mean, it's not, but let's say it is. Um, you can't really use a lose a public key, or at least that's the idea. Um, and, but public key crypto is slow, so we're going to take a symmetric key, we're going to encrypt it with the public key, and that's how we go from there. Um, biggest problem with this is that very often you'll lack forward secrecy. Um, at some point, my TLS certificate, so what forward secrecy means is at some point, if my TLS certificate gets compromised, does that mean that all of the previous conversations under that certificate, are they compromised in the sense that you can go decrypt them now? Or are they, does it just mean that the attacker can pretend to be me from now on? So if you have forward secrecy, um, they can only do the pretend to be me from now on. If you don't, then that means that all of our previous conversations are no longer private. Um, static defailment in RSA, same idea. Uh, anytime that you see a long-term static key and it is not being actively used with a new ephemeral key, that is a bad idea. Uh, get, uh, just don't have it. Uh, one, one of the ways that this is currently being implemented is in ETLS, which I'm told is uh, Enterprise TLS, I think the E stands for, uh, and I think my opinion on that can be summarized as TLS 1.3 is secure, and some vendors think that that is bad, and therefore we need to fix it. Um, so some other problems, uh, you, know, you can probably see these coming, these are getting more and more obvious, uh, I think, uh, are raw primitives, so there's a lot of cases where um, where a primitive is not being put in an appropriate construction, people are being told to use the primitive itself, and that generally leads to disaster. For one, for example, RSA. Uh, I mentioned a pile of RSA attacks, but there are uh, many, many more, uh, and you need complex tricks to make RSA safe. 
Um, these are called padding, typically. I don't think padding is a good word, because it, um, I don't know, it, it, sounds, it sounds too fluffy. It's like extremely necessary. It's more like safety break or something. Um, now, it was, RSA was an extremely important protocol. I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to beat it down too much, but it's time to put it out to pasture. It has le led to way too many problems. Finite field if you Hellman, finally, at least this thing is mostly gone. Um, ECDSA, if you see ECDSA directly, pretty unsafe, um, in particular because the, the K parameter in ECDSA is like the worst possible case for all cryptographic parameters ever. If you have a tiny, tiny, tiny bias in your randomness, for example, then eventually you leak your private key. Um, this is not a hypothetical, like, you know, um, uh, for example, PlayStation, uh, Sony lost, all, lost the ability to sign PlayStation 3 uh, games because they screwed up uh, ECDSA. Um, generally, direct ECDH, like, any again, anytime that you're taking a long-term static key and you're not combining it with a temporary uh, ephemeral key, um, just avoid. Um, and finally... Uh, I want to introduce a new concept called the axis of concern. Um, and the axis of concern is basically, the idea is I want to give you a tool so that if you look at a new spec, you can just like skim it, see what it introduces, and decide how worried you should be about this thing. I'm not saying, you know, if you get a high axis of concern uh, uh, score, for lack of a better phrase, then, um, you know, everything has to be bad, but I am saying it deserves a lot more caution. Um, so one thing that you can always do where I will give you, where, where I'm essentially always okay with, uh, with whatever you're going to do is you can read uh, a pile of bits from URandom. That is essentially always safe. Uh, you know, that is what your session cookies should be. People don't use URandom uh, enough. Uh, people introduce JWT for some reason. Just do this more often, please. Um, HMAC, similarly, I mentioned, you know, HMAC is one of the more conservative uh, specifications that I can think of. Um, you can use a decent AAD, AAD, but now we're already, you know, upping on the concern score a little bit. Um, you can use, like, Libsodium or KMS. Uh, if you start using signatures, then, I'd, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little bit worried. Um, asymmetric encryption static gauge, like I mentioned earlier, like, there's just way too many problem, things that can go wrong there. Uh, you have to be extremely careful. Um, if you start using RSA anything, like, to me, that just tells me that the, you know, uh, it's, it's not very good. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it appears that my fonts have changed between this and the last time that I... Uh, the, the magic of uh, presenting in the browser. Um, if you use a bare primitive, if you see, like, just AES or SHA-256 or whatever show up in the spec, uh, that is essentially, I mean, at that point, you should be ready to throw it away. Um, it does get worse. Uh, if you see pairings or zero-knowledge proofs, like, look, I think those things are really, really cool. Um, but also, uh, you know, they're, they're extremely concerning. There's a lot of potential problems with that. Um, you really want someone who knows what they're doing to review that. Um, if anyone uses their own primitives, uh, I mean, I hear there's a cryptocurrency that decided to implement a, bash, uh, a hash function in trinary for some reason. Uh, you know, obviously, like, it's almost certainly not going to work out. Um, any kind of bespoke wire protocol, uh, I'm, I'm generally concerned. Uh, blockchains, just no. Um, if your spec requires animal sacrifice, that's probably also a bad thing. Uh, and finally, if you use JWT, like, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. Um, so in conclusion, look, hindsight is 2020, and I get that. And, you know, please don't take this as uh, me just ranting about all for, for 45 minutes. Um, but I could have told you that ALG was a bad idea in 2015, uh, which is when JWT came out. Uh, history rhymes, so I think that a lot of the problems that we're seeing, like, they keep coming back. They're very similar problems. Um, you see them in different contexts, but, you know, that's, uh, you, can learn, you can learn from history and prevent problems in the future. Um, my goal with this talk was to build some intuition, uh, you know, and there are good things that come out of IETF, too. There are plenty of bad things that I said about it, but, um, you know, there are, there are useful things that you can get out. Um, you, too, can learn crypto vulnerabilities. That is actually possibly the most important lesson that I want you to learn out of this. There are many, many ways that you, if you want to, uh, like literally anyone in this, in this room, uh, if you are here, uh, you are smart enough. Like, I, there are a lot of people that, for some reason, think that, like, crypto is, I don't know, weird alien science. It is not. Uh, we can teach you how to do this. Um, and with that, uh, thanks. That's all I have. Uh, and finally, one more thing. By listening to me yap for 50, uh, 50, 45 minutes, sorry, you have unlocked the uh, me free tier. Uh, so if you have any follow-up questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to take those uh, either through email or uh, I'll be around at the conference. So don't hesitate to talk to me. Cool. And I have 30 seconds. So.